So is I'll I'll begin the meeting because we'd like to keep to a schedule if we can. So good afternoon. Uh, so if I, could, if I could call the meeting to order, please. Okay, thank you. Please just take a seat and uh, we'll begin. So good, good, ap good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you probably all know me now, uh, but if you don't, my name is Dave Halikowski and I'm the president of BC Schizophrenia Society. Today, I have the honor of welcoming you to our annual general meeting and panel presentation. To start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded land of the Coastal Salish peoples, the home of the Musqueam, Slave Taith, and the Squamish. I also want to take a moment to thank the members, donors, volunteers, stakeholders, and members of the general public who are joining us today, both here and online. You need to speak to the I can't hear you, Okay. 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 Thank you. Sorry about that. As a reminder, because of updates in the BC Societies Act, we are required to change our terms of membership. Everybody should have received a membership package along with a notice of the AGM in the mail before today's meeting. Today, only those who have, a com have completed that form and signed to be a BCSS society member are able to vote. For our members, I would like to call your attention to the colored card that you picked up at the registration table. This is your voting card. Please hold it up when you're asked to vote. That's this card here. I now call to order the British Columbia Schizophrenia Society's 2018-2019 Annual General Meeting. And I would now like to establish a quorum. So, Andrew, have we quorum? Yes. We have quorum. The adopted, the, ad, <coughs> the, the agenda is in your package and uh, I would like to have a motion made to accept the agenda. Jane Duvall, second. Jamie Graham, all those in favor? Green cards? I, I think we have a majority, so I'll, I'll declare the motion carried. So the approval, the next item on the agenda then is the approval of the 2017-18 AGM minutes of September 23rd, 2018. I would, if you've all had an opportunity to read them, I would now entertain a motion to accept those minutes. Colleen Crosley, Fred Daw, all those in favor? I think we have a majority, so I'll declare the motion carried. I would now like to introduce our auditor, Eric Ellis, from Tompkins Wasley Chartered Accountants. He will be presenting the report uh, uh, for the fiscal year ending uh, March 31st, 2019. Eric? everyone. Again, my name is Eric Alice. I'm with Tompkins Wasley, <coughs> Chartered Professional Accountants, and I'm happy to present to you your 2019 financial statements. There were some copies out front. Um, I don't know if we have it overhead as well, so I'm just going to briefly go through it. Um, yeah, can't hear you? Yeah, can't hear you? Okay, can't hear you. Know yeah, it's kind of an awkward... Can we use this? 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 Mike is not tall enough. Yeah. It's, it's short, guys. <laughs> is that better? Okay, good, good. Yeah, so, uh, and thank you very much for the appointment as auditors. It's a job we take very seriously. Our job is to present an opinion on your financial statements. 
Um, again, we take it very seriously. We have a lot of experience. We currently audit over 150 nonprofits and charities throughout British Columbia. And what we do as auditors, we look for the risk of material misstatement. Where do we think it can go wrong in the financial statements? So that's making sure your cash exists, all the program funding has been earned and is complete. Uh, looking at all the expenses, most importantly, the payroll expenses, make sure there's valid and backup for the payroll. And make sure you're in compliance with CRA regulations because you're registered charity, tax receipting, uh, T4s, that type of thing. So we apply the audit tests, and that all went really, really well. So you'll find our auditor's report on pages one and two of the financial statements. It's a clean opinion stating in the second paragraph that we believe that these financial statements present fairly for your March 31st. 2019 fiscal year end. So that's a, a good report. So a big thank you to management and the board of directors for their assistance, maintaining good accounting records, and for the board of directors providing oversight over the financial reporting process. So that's the audit report on pages one and two. And then I'll just quickly highlight, what did I do with my glasses? Uh, I'll highlight the financial statements. There's two main financial statements in the financial statements. They're found on pages three and five. Page three is the statement of financial position. So that is the balance sheet at March 31st where the assets and liabilities stood at that date. And there it shows about $1.6 million in assets and about $1.5 million in liabilities. And the summary on that page is you have about cash and investments of 1.5 and then you have grant funding you've received in advance. And that's a liability that will be revenue in the next couple years. So that is really the two main components on the balance sheet on page three. And then you have a little bit of working capital, net assets of $50,000 to provide your services. Those net assets did decrease a little bit. On page five is the revenues and expenses for the year. And for the year, you had just over $2 million, a little bit under $2.1 million in revenues. And a, a bulk of that, about 87%, comes from program funding from uh, the BC Ministry of Health and various others, and that came at about 1.8 million. And then you had donations and other revenues that brought it to 2 million. And then on the expense side, it was at $2.1 million. And a large component of that, 76% is for wages providing uh, your program cost. Overall, very little overhead in the expenses. About 80, I think it's, uh, it was noted about 87% of all the expenses go to direct program uh, delivery and costs, so there's very little overhead. But overall, there was a little loss this year, 55000 for the year. So those are the two main financial statements in the audit report. Any questions? <coughs> Looks all right. All right, well, thanks. That's my report. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> this is better. That mic is too short for us guys. <laughs> um, so I now would like uh, a motion to approve the financial statement. Jamie, seconded by Paul. All those in favor? Lots of green cards. <laughs> Declare the motion carried. So I now, uh, next item on the agenda then is the appointment of our auditor for the coming uh, fiscal year, 2019 and 20. Uh, and uh, we are recommending that we continue to uh, employ the uh, auditors that we currently have of Tompkins Wolsey, LLP. So I'll entertain a motion to do that. Matt, seconder, John, all those in favor? Contrary, carried. So the annual report from the president. This is the next item. As Gerhard, Andrew, and I sat down to look back at this past year, we recognized that we are closer to improving the quality of life You'll pardon me for having to flip pages, but, but I didn't memorize this. Oh, 
So for families affected by schizophrenia and psychosis through uh, education, support, public policy, and research. As an organization, we are now, uh, we now are grateful for many things. We were grateful for the BCSS that has been able to maintain its core programs and services and offer support and education to families across the province. And we couldn't have done it without the dedication of our regional educators, regional managers, and our volunteers. This past year, through uh, additional community partnerships and <coughs> funding, BCSS has also, was also able to facilitate strengthening families together, First Nation programs in communities that were affected by the wildfires in 2017. BCSS has introduced a new uh, workshop format for our Teens and Control program, and after successfully completing the pilot, the Kids and Teens and Control team has developed training and curriculum man manuals for those Teens and Control workshops, and they are now ready to train new facilitators and excited to expand those workshops in other communities around the province. We are grateful that BCSS has been able to continue to advocate for families. Families have told us through uh, stories after story that BC mental, the BC Mental Health Act has been crucial in saving lives of their loved ones. And this is one key reason why we will continue to strongly support the BC Med Mental Health Act in the face of court challenges. We are grateful to the Society and Foundation's commitment to funding research that seeks a cure for schizophrenia. The BCSS Foundation partnered with the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research to identify, vet, and fund research conducted right here in British Columbia. Because the Michael Smith Foundation matches our foundation donor gifts for research, we are effectively doubling the impact of our fundraising efforts. And we are now most grateful for the generous support from donors, corporate sponsors, government contracts, and our great volunteers. Our great volunteers in helping us to make a positive impact on the lives of those affected by schizophrenia psychosis, and other serious mental illnesses. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I would now like to present the, the new board of directors or for the year 2019 and 20. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask them to stand as I call out their names so that people can see who they are. So uh, as... Uh, as starting out with our sort of executive committee, uh, the, the president for the coming year will be myself. Uh, the vice president will be Matt Langwa. Matt, would you like to stand? Thank you. Our treasurer is Joanne Leung. Joanne. Our secretary is Colleen Crosley. Our directors are Jamie Graham. Fred Daw, Paul Busson, Paul, Matt Langma, or sorry, Matt's already been introduced, uh, Lena Bortnick, who is not here, unfortunately couldn't attend, Lena, Lena is from Campbell River. Don Monzur, who is not here as well from Victoria. Susan Inman, who is also not in attendance, or Susan is at the back. Hi, Susan. Donna Monzur, Donna. And Aaron Berger, is Aaron here today? And uh, Stephanie Rez Rezanoff, who is also not able to attend today. So other business, <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. And I'd also like to thank uh, the current board for the support that I know that we're going to have throughout the year. And thank uh, most of them are past board members as well. So I'd like to thank them for all the work that they've put in in the, in the past year to get us to where we're at. Thank you so much. So at this point, I'd like to take a moment and recognize one of our long-term supporters and board members, Dr. John Gray. John? <laughs> John, would you like to join me at the stage, please? John has been instrumental in helping BCSS respond quickly and timely to issues related to mental illness policies in BC. These issues include hospital and health authority discharge policies, challenges to the BC Mental Health Act, and the latest omnibus persons report. He has, he has also helped BCSS move forward uh, and bring attention and brings attention to new and upcoming treatments like cognitive remediation. We will miss him dearly and thank you for all you have done for us, John, and the family members affected by schizophrenia. Would you please accept this gift? is a token of our appreciation. I, I will gratefully accept it. Thank you. It's been a wonderful privilege. I'm not leaving. I will be on a committee, I'm sure. And I look forward to work, working with a great board that we now have. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I'm sure, I'm sure we'll see you back on the board. Thank you, Thank you so much. Today, the BC Schizophrenia Society's foundation, the fundraising arm of BCSS, is also seeing a change. Gerhard, Paul, Gerhard, would you like to come forward, please? Gerhard's term as chair of the foundation board is ended, and. Uh, so this is a man who has been part of BC, the BCSS family for many years. And six years ago, he took the task of chairing the foundation board. His passion, humor, and dedication to ensuring that BCSS is able to continue offering programs and service, services is inspiring and never ending. Thank you for the legacy that you leave behind. And I'm uh, going to ask Jeff Found I'm sorry, but all we'll do it for, on behalf of the foundation, Gary. Jeff was here, but he had an emergency to go. Renato? Okay, thank you, Renato. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, Jeff Bagshaw, who uh, has known uh, Gerhard for longer than I, uh, had a family emergency, so he couldn't be here today. So I'm just stepping in on his behalf. And I've known Gerhard for about three years now. And he has been a tremendous mentor, a tremendous leader for the foundation, primarily because he lives, he lives the, the, the challenge that every one of the members of the society live. And that is, you know, Gerhardt's got an incredible experience with schizophrenia in his family. His, he has three sons and, and they have schizophrenia and he has willfully explained and shared so much of that, that journey with us on the foundation, but also with society members and has attended many speaking occasions and has been very open about the challenges of dealing with the disease. Jeff Bagshaw, who would have spoken today, um, told me that, that one of the things that he wanted to say at, at this thank you is that uh, when he uh, first uh, met Gerhardt and was working on, on his cell phone, one of the things he was typing on uh, when he was trying to text Gerhardt was his name. And the autocorrect on his cell phone kept changing it to Great Heart. <laughs> and that is truly who Gerhardt is. He has a great heart. He has given and given and given. And now he's going to take a short break after serving many years. We hope that he'll be back. And on behalf of the foundation of the society and all of the people that you have personally helped, uh, thank you so much. 
It's been a privilege for me to be w getting to know you, and uh, I'm really looking forward to carrying on the torch that you have so, so well lit for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. Thank you Thank you, everyone, and so welcome. Uh, a great, a great honor for Gerhard, I think, to have served us. <clears throat> At this point now, uh, as you all know, uh, we have a new uh, chief operating officer, not operating chief executive officer. Sorry, uh, the, her name is Phaedra Aldrich, and she's just come on board in the last uh, month, six weeks or five weeks. So I would like to introduce Phaedra to everybody, uh, all our members and donors and, uh, and guests. Phaedra, would you like to come up and say a couple words? Thanks, Phaedra. I have a loud voice, I have the opposite problem, so you can probably hear me without the microphone. Um, so yeah, so thank you, Dave. So yes, as Dave said, I started my job about a month ago, in fact, it was exactly one month ago that I started. And I can honestly say I am so happy and proud to say that I'm with this organization, and I truly mean that. In fact, just this past week, one of the regional managers sent me a document, and it was talking about finding joy at work. And she asked me, I hope you've been able to find joy at your job in the last 20 days that you've been here. And I put a lot of thought in my response to her because my answer was a resounding yes. I have been able to find joy. Doesn't mean it's been easy, but I have been able to find joy. And I can honestly say the reason I've been able to find that joy is because of the team. I honestly, in all my years, have not met a more dedicated and loyal group of people that I get the joy of working with. And today is a perfect example of that. It just, it astounded me the effort that the staff, the staff team put into this event for this entire weekend. So it's just a perfect example, as well as the boards. I work with two amazing, dedicated volunteer boards that give up their time to all work towards the same cause. And I'm just truly, truly grateful for that. But there's a few people today I want to recognize. Number one, Jean. Thank you. I know you're already working over there. And Jean has been tasked with putting together this weekend. And I just have to recognize Jean. Do you want to wave your hand there? I know you're hard at work. <laughs> um, just to say, Jean, you've been able to keep us all in line. I know sometimes it's like herding cats, but you were able to get us all together. So I just want to formally acknowledge you and just thank you for everything you did for this weekend. Andrew. And yes, thank you. <laughs> And Andrew, Andrew stepped into the interim role, and I just want to applaud and commend Andrew Stewart, and uh, he's over there taking minutes right now and <laughs> nodding, but there he is. And Andrew has been a huge help, not only with this event, but also in my transition and beforehand. And once again, I just want to formally thank and acknowledge all the hard work and dedication that Andrew Stewart has put into this organization. Thank you, Andrew. We also have lots of other staff that made today and made this weekend possible. Cynthia is somewhere in the audience, somewhere, maybe not. There she is, there's Cynthia and Renette. Hardeep is here, April is here, Catherine is here, Rachel is here. So thank you for taking your Sunday and your Saturday to, to help out, as well as all the volunteers. I want to recognize the important role that volunteers play, and I really want to commend and applaud all the staff that are here today, as well as all the volunteers. So thank you. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge Susan Inman, and Susan was the individual, the force, the driving force behind the panel that we all get the good fortune of hearing with all our speakers here today. And Susan put a lot of hard work and dedication. So Susan, once again, just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you've done. And uh, you, are a major, you are a major force behind this organization. So just want to acknowledge Susan Inman. Thank you. Susan. And I just thanked you. <laughs> I'm good. And uh, to all our members, 
If you're not a member, please do join. We want to hear your story. If you're a member, then we get to connect with you. We get to send you updates. We get to give you the latest news that we have. And we want to hear your voice. We need to get our voice out there. And I'm going to have, I have a long list of things that I want to accomplish here with the team and taking, you know, being a part of this organization. And some of those main goals, number one, is going to increase awareness about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, we all need to say the word. We need to get it out there. We need to talk about it. So we need to increase awareness about schizophrenia. We also need to get out there about what we do to make it very clear what we as a team, volunteers, staff, two boards, members, what we do. We play a huge role in many, many communities across this province and we need to make sure that we get that message out there about what we do. So that's another key thing. And another final point that we need to do is we need to raise money. And the money is going towards all those amazing programs, our educational programs. I mean, the reach out tours. If you haven't seen one, please get out and see it. It's, it's being shown to throughout the school districts. It's an amazing, amazing program. And we need to make sure we have the funds and the dollars to be able to support that. As well as our kids and teens in control. Rachel's a manager for that and does a tremendous job with supporting our families. Strengthening families together, as well as our strengthening families together, First Nations. Once again, to the staff for putting on an amazing program and all of our family support groups. We are there when those families need us and I want to make sure that we have the funds and the staff and the power to be able to continue to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you for being here today and thank you for providing that glimmer of hope for everybody out there that needs us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro. And, and I know that we all look forward to working with you over the next several years in, in accomplishing those great things that you have uh, envisioned for us. So thank you so much. You know, thought I'd have been ready for the next page, eh? At this point, then, that concludes the business, unless there's any new business that anybody would like to raise. Uh, hearing no voices and seeing no hands up in the air, I uh, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn this annual meeting. Good, Jamie, Susan, uh, all those in favor? Carried. So the next item then on our agenda is our panel presentation and uh, I would now like to ask Joanne to come up to the, to the podium. Joanne is going to be the MC for the next portion of this of this uh, event so and I'd like to thank Joanne so much for doing taking that task on for us. Thank you everybody for coming. Have a good good meeting. Hi. Uh, I'd like to have all the panelists to come up to the stage and take the seat. Oops. Am I speaking under the mic? I do have a very soft voice, so if you don't hear me, I'll probably shift off the mic and just let me know. L louder? Okay. I always get that request, so I'll try. <laughs> just uh, let me know again if I shift. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, on behalf of the BC Schizophrenia Society, and I would like to welcome you to an afternoon packed with the useful information for families
coping with the psychotic disorders. My name is Joanne Leung, and I am a board member of the BC Schizophrenia Society and its foundation. And I will be your moderator for the portion of this, uh, of this program. And uh, today we have invited a panel of five experts in the field. And each person will touch upon a different issue surrounding inpatient care for people with serious mental illnesses. Each panelist will provide a short presentation and to save time, we are asking you all to hold your questions until all the presentations are done. To make sure you don't forget your questions, uh, we have our BCSS regional managers, Danita and Hardeep, will be passing out index cards for you to write them down as you uh, come up with them. And after all, after all the presentations have been completed, we will open the floor for questions. And Danita and Hardeep will come around with the microphone. And at that point, you can address the question to the panelists that you wish. And also the event is being webcast to people around the province. And the people at home will be able to submit their question as well. Uh, they can in the chat do it in the chat window on the right side of their screen. And we'll have uh, a staff here to help us to read out those questions. And the recording at the end uh, of the, today's program will be made available on the BCSS website. Without further ado, uh, I will introduce each of the panelists as they come up to speak. And the first one is Dr. Alan Bates. So Dr. Alan Bates finished his PhD on neuroimaging at the University of Notting Nottingham before completing his MD and psychiatry residency at UBC. Today, Dr. Bates is the provincial practice leader for psychiatry at BC Cancer and he is also the president of the BC Psychiatric Association. Did I have that right? Okay, all right. Here. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you go ahead. Great. Uh, th thanks very much. Thanks uh, so much for inviting me to, uh, to speak. And um, so I'm going to be speaking about a, uh, a joint report that um, has been worked on by both the, uh, the BC Psychiatric Association uh, and, and also the BC Schizophrenia Society. And um, in case I, I forget later, uh, so John has brought uh, some copies of the report. And so there's a few copies uh, down here that you can have a look at uh, at, at breaks uh, if you like. Um, and uh, there's also a list there to put your email address if you'd like to uh, be emailed a, a copy of it. And um, so I, I, though, um, though I was invited to, uh, to come and present some of the highlights of this report today, I want to really emphasize that um, uh, this involved a number of people, both from, uh, from our executive and also from BCSS. Uh, and, and I've listed uh, everybody who I could think of there. I, I'm, I'm probably forgetting uh, one or two people, so I apologize if, um, if I have. Uh, but, but I really want to, um, to emphasize from this list that, um, you know, that, that John and Jane and Susan have really been uh, the driving forces behind uh, getting all of this done and, and getting the, uh, the report um, written. Uh, I don't have any relevant disclosures to, the, uh, to this talk. Um, I, I threw BC Cancer. BC Cancer gets some money from, from Pfizer and some of that has come to psychiatry. Um, but actually, um, I have, a, I have a, another kind of distant uh, disclosure, which is that um, the, the very first research uh, grant that ever benefited me in, in any way uh, was back in around the year 2000 or so, and that was from the Dr. Norma Calder Foundation. Um, and I, I understand that it's maybe merged with a different foundation or something like that now, but, um, but essentially I, I, uh, I owe it to you guys for me getting my start in the whole area of uh, anything related to um, to schizophrenia or mental health or, or psychiatry. And, um, and that's because I was working with, uh, with Peter Little at the time, who some of you may remember. 
Uh, and I moved with him uh, from here in BC to, uh, to Nottingham. And, uh, and that's the monster you created at the time. I was working on, uh, our lab was EEG and fMRI uh, to do with schizophrenia and, and siblings and, and healthy young people. Um, so, um, so the, the report essentially, um, you know, the, the premise of it is that uh, though there's other important parts of the system, including prevention and, uh, and post-hospital care, community care, uh, that uh, the acute psychiatric, psychiatric beds are uh, an essential part uh, of, of the system. And, uh, you know, doctors, nurses, family members, patients, we've all noticed that um, there's, there's signs every day that, uh, that there's a problem in terms of the number of beds that are available. Um, but some of these things that all of us are noticing is, you know, patients piling up uh, in the emergency department, uh, having to be there for a really long time. Uh, I've personally, I can remember as a resident, having to admit patients, um, you know, in the emergency department to seclusion rooms or quiet rooms, even though they didn't need one, just because that was the only space uh, that was available. Uh, sometimes, uh, I'm sure you've seen, patients are just kept in the hallways in places like VGH uh, for, uh, for a fair while. Uh, sometimes patients are admitted to non-psychiatric units uh, that aren't specialized in caring for them. And um, I think it's, it's fair to say that sometimes patients just aren't admitted at all uh, because there isn't the space. And, you know, technically that's not supposed to happen, but I, I think it's fair to say that uh, sometimes we wish we could admit somebody, uh, but, um, you know, triage or choices have to be made and, and people just don't get admitted. Um, and then also there's a lot of pressure, uh, I know, on my inpatient psychiatric uh, colleagues to, uh, to always be discharging people to keep that flow uh, happening through our hospitals. And sometimes, you know, that may be uh, too early or, or less than ideal. And so it's not just us in psychiatry who are noticing uh, these things. As part of developing the report, we reached out to our emergency medicine colleagues and uh, my counterpart for emergency medicine, he, he wrote back to me, uh, I applaud your efforts to raise the issue that is too often not addressed, and unfortunately it seems to get worse every year to the detriment of our mentally ill patients. And um, so we wanted to um, uh, look at uh, what little data is out there. One of the big problems is there isn't a lot of uh, good data for us to work with. Um, but in the 2016-17 fiscal year, uh, there were almost 40,000 discharges from psychiatric units in BC. Uh, uh, there were some sort of repeat, um, repeat patients, repeat visitors uh, that made up about 27,000 uh, unique people. Uh, about half of them, I guess at the time of discharge, were voluntary at that point and half were uh, involuntary or certified under the Mental Health Act. And uh, one of the things that we're noticing is that there's these kind of competing demands uh, for these beds. Uh, so not all, only are there people with severe and chronic mental illness like schizophrenia, uh, but also there's people with severe anxiety or depression uh, that at times need to uh, have inpatient admissions. And often, actually, those people are probably the most likely to just not uh, be admitted or not get the help that really they, they need because of uh, people with more severe or acute needs. Um, there's also a number of people with personality disorders who require at least short admissions to hospital. Uh, and then something over the last few years that has really uh, been part of the, the tidal wave that we're seeing is, is substance use disorders, so things like crystal meth and people presenting uh, essentially like um, uh, you know, chronic or acute psychosis and, and taking a fair while to, um, to get back to their baseline and, and be able to be discharged. And so, so clearly there's, um, there's many possible harms to uh, there, there not being adequate uh, beds available. Uh, worsening of symptoms, decreased time to relapse, uh, suicide, violence towards others, and often that's uh, family members, uh, premature death, it, working in, at BC Cancer, uh, I know that we have uh, data that um, just looking at anxiety and depression, so not, not even things like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, the people with uh, significant anxiety or depression uh, die about two years before uh, everybody else does on average at BC Cancer. Uh, and and uh, Bill Honer actually is probably the person who most knows about this uh, phenomenon of the, the comorbidity uh, of, um, of our psychiatric patients. Um, also incarceration, burden on the justice system, uh, burden on caregivers, particularly family, and, and also uh, burden on community resources. So paramedics, uh, the Vancouver police are kind of at their wits end with uh, the number of uh, calls they attend to. They're primarily uh, psychiatric or, or mental health uh, related. 
Uh, so again, uh, going back to our, our emergency doctors, um, so trying to trying to find more uh, evidence. Um, you know, they've they've essentially said it's very common for them to see people waiting for 72 hours in the emergency department. This isn't just a lower mainland thing. Uh, another physician here from Kelowna saying essentially the same thing. Uh, it's clear that there's just been a big increase in patients. So going from 2005-06, when there was about 12,000 involuntary admissions, uh, fast forward about 10 years, it's over 20,000. So that's a 71% uh, increase uh, without really a significant change in the number of beds or the resources uh, that are available. And uh, also, uh, we, we know that, um, that the units are, and hospitals are just plain full. So, uh, the times that I've worked at places like St. Paul's or BGH, they're very frequently under what's called overcapacity protocol, uh, which means that all units, including the psychiatry units, are, are over 100% capacity. Uh, and there's, um, there's data from the UK, for example, suggesting that for a psychiatric unit to be able to admit people appropriately and function at its uh, best, it really should be hovering around 85% uh, capacity. Also, um, you know, violence is something that, um, you know, fortunately, very severe incidents are relatively rare, and, and I know that you know, people um, with mental illness are more likely to be victims of violence than to be perpetrators of violence. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there does seem to be more and more of these, these kinds of stories in the media of uh, psychiatrists or nurses, and um, you know, I, I know I don't have to tell you about um, family members in other settings where uh, where, where violence likely related to uh, inadequate uh, resources is um, more and more common. Um, and then uh, again, you know, um, something that, uh, that Dr. Uh, Honer and his team have worked a lot on as well to really uh, bring light to, uh, but um, something that we all see are, uh, is um, discharge to, to homelessness or discharge to shelters. Um, and so this is uh, a photo that I stole off of CDV's website, but. Um, uh, through my residency, I spent pretty much every Sunday morning uh, in the downtown east side hanging out with uh, people there. And, and I can tell you that this is not a totally atypical uh, room uh, down there. There's lots of rooms that, that look like this. And we can all agree this is not a therapeutic environment for somebody to be uh, discharged back to. Um, so uh, last, uh, last thing is, uh, is readmission rates. So in the, um, the ombudsperson's uh, report, uh, it seemed there was probably about a 43% um, uh, readmission rate within uh, that year. So, um, you know, you could hypothesize that people are not getting uh, enough treatment or adequate treatment over the time that they're admitted. And so, so what's needed? Um, in, uh, in a recent review of advanced nations, Canada placed 29 out of 35 in terms of the number of acute care beds per capita. Uh, when uh, there's been research that shows that when you get below 50 or so, that's when you tend to start to see all the problems that, uh, that I've just been listing. And, uh, and right now, Canada's sitting around 30. Uh, when, when I emailed that out to uh, some of our people on our executive, they said, you know, we're actually more like 14 or something like that in, in, in our community. And um, so, so we have uh, room to grow for sure. And, um, you know, the, the question is, would it make a difference if, uh, if there was change made by, uh, by, by government? And that experiment has uh, actually been done uh, not that long ago in the state of South Australia, where they increased the number of beds by 12%, uh, and found that in that state and that state only, that the suicide rate uh, dropped, and, uh, and also that uh, ER wait times uh, became the lowest in 10 years, even though there were, continued to be an increase in number of people with psychiatric presentations. And uh, so last slide, the recommendations that, um, that we're calling on, uh, calling for are as a, uh, a needs-based approach um, to, uh, to creating resources and boosting resources. Uh, collection of data, like I say, it's been very hard for us to find uh, good data to, um, to back up what we all see every day. Um, safe and supported housing. And also a, a concrete plan that uh, is not only for people with schizophrenia, but also uh, other uh, populations uh, such as people with traumatic brain injury, uh, developmental disabilities, uh, where, where like um, BC Schizophrenia Society, it just seems often that there's no, uh, nowhere to go, no appropriate resources. Uh, and that's, that's the end of my part. That's where I hang out. You're welcome to, uh, to email me. Thank you, Mr. Bate.
Okay, and now our next panelist is John. Yep. And uh, Dr. Dr. Gray. And that. So you have heard the introduction from uh, Dave earlier. So. So, whoops, sorry, I got my pages. Okay, so Dr. John Gray is a psychologist by training. He has worked as a clinician and a psychiatric hospital executive director in Saskatchewan. In BC, he was director of rehabilitation and services for the elderly in the Ministry of Health. He is the lead author of the book, Canadian Mental Health Law and Policy. Dr. Gray is a past president of the Schizophrenia Society of Canada and a BC Schizophrenia Society board member. And he is the co-chair of the BC Schizophrenia Society's policy, public policy committee. He has helped lead the fight against the challenge to the BC Mental Health Act made under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Thank you, Joanne. And I'm so pleased that Joanne didn't introduce me as she did the other people as an expert. Because as you know, X is the unknown quantity in algebra and spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> but it, it, it's great to be here and to uh, to be here with my fellow panelists on this very important issue of uh, access to services uh, and, and related issues. So I want to get me up there. There I am. Um, and this is the title of my talk. I'm going to be talking, <coughs> excuse me, this cat has a very really short tail. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Mental Health Act um, confidentiality, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Ombudsperson's Report, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons of Disabilities, and proposed review of the Mental Health Act, all in 12 minutes, so it's going to be pretty quick. <laughs> but we do have time afterwards to uh, make comments and, and uh, ask questions. So. The BC Health Act, um, BC Mental Health Act, and what I'm doing here is talking about w whether these legislative issues help people with serious mental illness or maybe hinder them or possibly hinder them. And the Mental Health Act, as I'm not going to go into detail on it, but if you're, if you're interested in the Mental Health Act, there's a, a wonderful um, guide to the Mental Health Act, which I sort of wrote a long time ago. <laughs> it's still wonderful. Um, but it's on, you can get it off the, the web, um, no problem at all. And what it does is explain to people uh, in, in, in uh, straightforward language how the, the uh, act works. It gives clues for family members who may, may be concerned about a person with schizophrenia or likely schizophrenia or serious mental illness as to what you can do if they want to accept voluntary treatment, how you can get treatment, involuntarily <clears throat> because really when we're talking about these issues it's the it's the person who if the person says look I want to get treatment for my particular uh, condition there's no issue they just go into hospital like any other person with appendicitis or whatever it only becomes an issue when the person says there's nothing wrong with me these voices that I'm hearing in my head are, are completely normal and um, they're certainly not an illness. And even if you put me in hospital, I'd resist having treatment because I don't think there's anything wrong with me. So the Mental Health Act does that. It helps people get into treatment who otherwise wouldn't get into treatment. And we see many of them, as, as you were just pointing out, lying in the, uh, in the alleyways uh, in downtown. In fact, I was almost stepping over somebody this morning. The second thing about the Mental Health Act is that once a person gets into hospital, they are treated. Now that sounds sort of obvious, doesn't it? Why would you go to hospital unless you were there for treatment? But some provinces, and I'll get to this uh, a bit later, some provinces um, allow you to refuse the treatment that's necessary for your recovery and for your release. And I'll talk about this court case where that's what some people in this province want.
So one of the issues that comes up with many families is the issue of I need information. My son just got dis uh, discharged from the hospital. Um, he's on some sort of medication. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the effects are. I don't know what, what to look for if he's go go not, get, not taking them and getting worse. I've asked the doctor and the doctor says, no, I'm sorry, I can't tell you, it's confidential. Or the nurse says the same thing. And they're usually doing it out of ignorance because they haven't read the, uh, what's called the Freedom of, Protect Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. It certainly says that you, the clinician, must keep things that are told to them confidential. And that, that's as it should be. They can only be released if the person themselves says, no, it's fine, you can tell my mother or my father or whoever uh, anything about me. Then the physician can do that. But sometimes when the person says, no, I don't want you to tell my, my parents, uh, people say, well, I've, I've got to respect that. And we've had some terrible suicides, actually in Victoria, out of you, Vic, where that's exactly what happened. Uh, they, they knew the person was likely to suicide. They didn't tell the parent that the person did kill themselves. But the, the act actually does have a fair amount of leeway. What it says is, it says, um, it, applies to, it applies to regional health authorities, so it applies to hospitals, etc. and it says that public bodies, that's a hospital, may release necessary personal information to third parties, that's you, without the consent of the client, where disclosure is required for continu continuity of care or for compelling reasons if someone's health or safety is at stake. So it's not only if, if it's it, you know, dire danger, it's if their health or, or safety is at risk. So this, is, this uh, document is discussed in this book that I mentioned to you. It, it's, a, it's not part of the Mental Health Act, it's part of the Freedom of Information Act, but it's described well in that particular document. Okay, so who's heard of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Okay, most of us. And you know that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is the overarching law that says all other laws in this country must comply with it. Uh, so it's got things like freedom uh, of expression, freedom of liberty, et cetera, et cetera. And so that makes a lot of sense, except, of course, there are complete competing rights. So you're, if you're an involuntary patient, yes, your uh, right to liberty is restricted, which the, the, the um, charter which the Charter doesn't like, obviously, but it also, also says that you have the right to life. To life, um, it doesn't specifically say health, but a lot of others do, so you have these competing rights. Um, and one of the big issues in British Columbia is the right not to refuse treatment if you're an involuntary patient. Thanks. Um, and that's really what this, there's a charter challenge at the moment, um, which, which is basically saying that you should be able to, if you're an involuntary patient, you should be able to refuse the treatment that you need in order to get well, in order to be released. And that's just a list of the things that happen if you have an involuntary patient who refuses a treatment. And that one where I've got increased, sec increased seclusion with Mr. Sevils. This is a man in Ontario who had a, um, a wish not to be treated. They didn't treat him. They couldn't treat him under their law. And he was held in seclusion for 404 days, solitary confinement, untreated. He only got treated when he, when he uh, assaulted a nurse and did very serious damage to the nurse. He was then treated, and then he got qu quite a lot better than what he had been. A lot better. He came out of seclusion, etc. So this case that's, that's ongoing is uh, now before the ap appeals court in British Columbia as to who, who can bring the appeal, whether it's... Um, an, an organization or whether you have to have a patient involved in the appeal. 
the Ombudsman's report. This was a report done in 2017 where they looked at a, a, a lot of, all of the um, forms under the mental health uh, which were done that year. It's a very good report, it's a very good analysis. Basically they found that a lot of the forms were not adequately done and the ombudsperson made a number of recommendations which are now being implemented by health authorities to improve that form filling. But he also said that what he thought was necess necessary was to have for each person when they're informed of their rights under the Act, which now happens, a nurse tells you what your, what your rights are, um, and nurse also um, sends that out to the, the near relative. The, uh, the lawsuit is basically saying that, uh, sorry, the ombudsperson is saying that what you need is a, a person to come in uh, for each patient to explain to them and not just explain to them, because that's what happens now, but show them the possibilities that they could go to the review panel, they could go to the courts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we disagree with that for a, for a number of reasons. It's going to cost about, we think, about $6.6 .6 million in terms of uh, paralegal people. And the group most likely to do it is, is we feel biased against psychiatric treatment. This is, this is what they say about psychiatric treatment. While many people use the term medications to describe a type of psychiatric treatment, others find this term misleading or offensive because many psychiatric treatments do not have a curative or therapeutic effect, but rather have a sedative effect that alters behavior. In other words, they're just basically sedatives. So that's our concerns. Just, just bring you this last uh, Quick point, the, Un the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, their committee that interprets that has said that it is, it is um, wrong. It's th they require the abolition of involuntary admission, of, in of involuntary treatment, and of community treatment orders, and also the uh, not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder uh, re requirement, they want that to go as well. So we're opposing that. Just very quickly, the last thing is, the, the Mental Health Act is always <laughs> uh, an exciting place to be in since, since that somebody wants it and somebody doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. So that the uh, Community Legal Assistance Society and others have said to the government that, that they should review the Mental Health Act now. And what we are saying is, if it is to be reviewed, then it should be done after the Ombudsman's report has been implemented, which will be about a year or so, and after the uh, Charter Challenge is completed, and that might, of course, take forever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Greg. Okay, our next presenter is Nancy Ford. She is the most recent retired executive director for the Pathways Serious Mental Illness Society, which is the previous uh, North Shore Schizophrenia Society. Nancy is also a family advocate and mother of a son diagnosed with sch schizoaffective disorder. She and her son have experienced firsthand the support and challenges family and patients encounter while in hospital. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to tell you stories. And um, at the end, maybe through questions, we can come up with some ideas on how to address some of the issues that do come up. Um, my son Daniel began showing signs of psychosis at age 26. We went to the family doctor and a referral was made to community psychiatric services, but we never received a call. Approximately six weeks later, Daniel's landlord phoned. Uh, Daniel had threatened him. 
In the meantime, I had picked up a pamphlet in my doctor's office with Pathways contact information and immediately gave them a call where I spoke to a member of the family support team. They told me to get him to emergency, if at all possible, and once there, cite the Mental Health Act based on Daniel's threat. Upon arrival at Daniel's apartment, I recognized immediately Daniel's acute distress and I was able to calm him using validation, reassurance, and encouraged him to come with me to the hospital. This is important. Seeing the acute distress in his eyes and his shoulders up around his ears, I immediately went into a soft, reassuring voice, reassuring him that we could get him help if he came with me. Once we arrived in emergency, we were treated as if Daniel was a typical patient, although moved to a quieter room. A psych nurse saw us, asked questions, and because I was there, I was able to help Daniel disclose his delusions. She explained we needed to wait to see the doctor and brought us each sandwiches. He relaxed, and the experience was one that we both expected from the hospital. Two hours later, a large man, head of the psychiatric department, arrived. He sat down across from Daniel, and without making eye contact, literally looking at the floor, and with no introduction, he simply announced that Daniel had a mental illness, that he needed medication, which he could take voluntarily or involuntarily. Either way, he would be taking it. Based on this psychiatrist's approach, Daniel's anxiety went through the roof, and he bolted out of the room. However, arrangements had been made and three security guards were waiting. They brought him to the ground, handcuffed him, and put him in a wheelchair. Then he was wheeled back into the room and given the medication. From there, he was stripped and locked into a secure room with a mattress on the floor. I was not allowed to see him for 48 hours. A very curious protocol, to say the least. Daniel never forgot that experience, and his first words to me were, I'll never forgive you for this. He was hospitalized four times after that, all requiring police intervention, who were, by the way, amazing every single encounter. He has since forgiven me, and he understands that he has schizoaffective disorder. My takeaway from that event and subsequent events was how terrified Daniel was each and every time he was psychotic. And when I validated his experience, Dan, you must be so scared. I'm on your side. You look like you could use some help. He settled each and every time. Now, if I can figure that out, surely psychiatric staff should be instructed on such protocol as a first approach. I expect, had Daniel been approached that way by that psychiatrist, he would have voluntarily stayed in hospital and received the treatment. During my tenure as executive director for Pathways, I encountered many such stories from families. A suicidal young man took himself to St. Paul's, begging to be admitted. He was assessed and released a few hours later. He begged the attending to keep him, and when he wouldn't leave, security was called, and he was escorted off the ward. Two weeks later, he committed suicide. Another young man in Vancouver General, also suicidal in hospital with broken bones due to an attempt, was also released, even though family begged the attending psychiatrist to keep him, at least until they found suitable treatment. He was also released and two days later killed himself. With involuntary committal, I heard stories from families indicating that the Mental Health Act was being used inappropriately, and that once a person is committed under the Act, basic human rights are being infringed upon. This is very, very serious, because the Mental Health Act then becomes uh, the, the attack focus, and really it's not the Act that's the issue. An example of this infringement is the use of the isolation room. We expect there is protocol for use in extreme cases, absolutely. However, it appears the isolation room is used more commonly as a standard course of treatment, with the federal prison systems addressing isolation in solitary confinement for people with mental illness. We have to question its use in our hospitals. With visitation, families have come with complaints that patients are being confined to their rooms, that families are not allowed to visit with their relative in the patient's room, and that visitation was denied to a, to, to a family member. It was explained by the nursing staff, due to the patient's behavior the previous day. 
Are patients being punished under the Mental Health Act? My concern is that the same treatment protocol that governs cancer patients, or any patient for that matter, should be standard or close to standard for those being treated for mental illness. With diagnosis, I heard from families of staff other than psychiatrists are making patient diagnosis. As an example, one patient during an early intake process was told she had borderline personality disorder and that she needed to get back to work. Another patient, again during intake, was told she didn't have clinical depression. You just need to pull yourself together and get back to work. Treatment for concurrent disorder. This is a common expression of concern for families with their relative being turned away because of addiction when treatment is needed. It is well researched that the two go hand in hand. If a patient arrives at a hospital requiring a treatment for cancer, heart disease, dementia, and has an addiction, they are not turned away. An accountability mechanism. There appears to be a lack of accountability mechanisms and no clear feedback loop for patients and families. It also appears that all staff are not using the Vancouver involvement policy. A psychiatrist recently asked a family member, what are you doing here? And suggested they leave, although the person with the illness had requested the family's support. I want to emphasize the appreciation expressed by families and myself when we encounter staff, doctors, and support workers who clearly go above and beyond. We hear those stories as well, and in response, Pathways hosts a Responsiveness to Families Award with a list of psychiatrists and nurses receiving recognition for their compassion and best practice. In fact, families come into the center with a long list of complaints. We encourage, when families come in, we encourage families to let go of the issues. Instead, focus on their ill relative and use the levers that do work within the system. Make friends with every staff, let go of any issues, and put your relative's health and wellness ahead of any challenge issued, challenging issues. There have been considerable advances in the understanding, treatment, and response to people with mental illness. My concern is that the staff who have been working in the system for years are still working from an old paradigm. Ensuring that all staff are receiving new, innovative, validating, respectful techniques to address the fear a patient often experiences upon admittance will help to address the often resulting challenging behaviors and will lead to overall better compliance. Serious mental illness is not a behavior and should not be treated as such any more than diabetes, cancer, or heart disease. So what's missing? Mental illness literacy. Schizophrenia and the serious mental illnesses are serious, and with any illness, education is critical to the best practice and outcome for families, the patient, and the community. This is not readily available. Family engagement. There continues to be a lack of understanding in the mental health community that family engagement, which is evidence-based and a Vancouver Coast health policy, is critical for the successful adjustment to living with schizophrenia or, for that matter, any medical condition. This gap appears with psychiatrists, nurses, social workers, admitting and discharge plans. As a family member, I had to remind staff that my son's condition impacted the whole family. His condition is complex, and his family, as his family advocate, I needed to leverage every member of his health community and our family to act as part of his team. If the system doesn't consider the family unit, costs will soar with four all too familiar enemies waiting in the wings, homelessness, addiction, violence, and law enforcement. Stigma continues to be present. In fact, and this is an extremely important observation, once past ER and admitting where families receive the typical treatment, our family members are pretty much treated like prisoners. Stripped, left in isolation room, rooms, and when they are good, they may get to see their families, otherwise visitation is sometimes denied. Please tell me what other medical condition would have that kind of response to an illness. Isolation upon admitting, denied visitation, lack of family engagement, with little to no mental literacy to deal with a diagnosis, and the waves of ensuing, emo ensuing emotions. No wonder families fall apart. People are left homeless, addicted, and in police custody. Again, there are some amazing people within the system, so let's hold on to those dearly. 
So my recommendations, holistic clinical practice, family engagement, empathy, education, and therapeutic support programs. Education, good psychoeducation programs for patients, just as you would for diabetes or cancer. Conditional discharge to address anisognosia. Anyone admitted under the Mental Health Act should be discharged on the condition that they attend team and psychiatric meetings, they take their medication. Once we inform families after repeated discharges that they could ask for a conditional discharge, patients generally got well with after, the, after the following uh, treatment. Family engagement. Psychosis can be terrifying. When my son experienced validation for his struggle and was given education and language to express his emotions, he settled down and got on with the business of adjusting to his situation and making the very best of it. However, the, this did not take place through the system, rather at home, with the family. Families must be part of the treatment plan. Finally, for the families in this room here today, I leave you with a quote. The families who are advocates, who are the voice of, of the movement. I heard recently from a family advocate referring to health services and the need for a family voice. He said, families, if you are standing on a teeter-totter with an elephant, don't stand in the middle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. I think she spoke with the voice of uh, many of the family have the, in mind and there. Okay, so we're about halfway through, and I hope you had writing down your questions, taking notes. And uh, the next, we will have Susan Inman. Susan is a BC Schizophrenia Society board member and the mother of a daughter who has been living with the schizophrenia for 19 years. Susan's memoir, after her brain book, Helping My Daughter Recover from Her Sanity, has been recommended by the National Association of Mental Illness, NAMI, the European Federation of Associations of Families of People with Mental Illness, and the Mental Health Commission of Canada. She writes about mental illness policies an archive of select articles written by Susan can be found on the Huffington Post and the Thai E. Susan is also a retired English and drama teacher. Here's Susan. And this makes it go forward, is that right? Do I have to point it? Rachel said yes. Do I have to point it at the screen? No. Just point anywhere. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm so happy that you're all here. This is my community, other families dealing with these life-changing circumstances. We are in it together. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the need to, how to reduce the need for inpatient care. In no way am I saying that we um, will uh, not need hospitals um, unless there's a miraculous cure and unbelievable quantities of research funding which doesn't currently exist for uh, um, solving the illnesses uh, that we are dealing with, we absolutely will need hospitalization. But there's a lot of um, elements in the current mental health system that can increase the need for hospitalization. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. The first one has already been mentioned by other speakers. Um, we have really inadequate public mental illness literacy campaigns. Today, October 6th, is the first day of this year's annual mental illness awareness campaign. Uh, this campaign was started in 1992 by the Canadian Psychiatric Association when I first encountered it in the early 2000s. Uh, it was terrific. Uh, I went to an evening at Children's Hospital. I got all the kinds of information that I need it. Um, the Canadian Psychiatric Association ran this event by itself for many years, and then it created a coalition with a variety of other mental health organizations with kind of different agendas. Somebody is... Can I get your attention? Thank you. Um, can you just speak a little bit louder, Susan? Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you for telling me this. You just have to talk louder. Yeah. Just speak louder. Is that good? <laughs> Thank you. I, I 
tell me again if I stray. So um, once the Canadian Psychiatric Association relinquished control to a coalition of groups with different ideas about what education should be, we've ended up in the last few years with what we now have. We have a campaign that does not provide basic information about these illnesses. So we have very poor national mental illness literacy knowledge. I don't think we would accept this about any other public health problem. So we don't have a campaign, if you go to the um, website of the Canadian Alliance Mental Illness Mental Health, which now runs it, you, we don't have a campaign or a website that tells people what the early warning signs are of these illnesses, uh, basic information about these disorders, what the best treatments are, where to go to get help. Basic information is missing, and we collectively tend to be very ignorant, and we don't necessarily make very good choices. So when we have the resulting delays in getting access to treatment, we have a lot of negative consequences. First of all, the longer people spend in untreated psychosis, the longer these aberrant neural pathways become habituated in people's brains, and it's much easier, even when somebody is treated, to relapse into uh, psychosis. As well, when people are psychotic and out there trying to deal with the world, they're in a really dangerous position. And it's very um, uh, understandable why people might decide to self-medicate with street drugs, and then you have even a more difficult problem. As well, people are easily victimized when they are out in the world and untreated with a psychotic disorder, easily become homeless, and we can thank Dr. Honer and uh, over here and Dr. McEwen, who really researched the population in the downtown east side and, and the homeless population. We know how many people really have underlying untreated severe mental illnesses. So we also end up with what's going on, an increasing rate of incarceration of people with untreated mental illnesses. Uh, we need psychoeducation for clients. Uh, you would think this is basic, since for all other illnesses, uh, a real goal of the um, health community is to help us understand whatever illness we have and how we can best manage it. Uh, and luckily, with programs like Strengthening Families Together and the Family to Family program that is still offered uh, through Pathways and Elsewhere, we have really good psychoeducation for families. We have almost no psychoeducation for clients. It's gotten worse through the years. And um, we have some good psychoeducation for clients through early psychosis intervention programs, but those are really small programs. Whenever I try to find out what is the model of care of providing people with essential information about their illnesses, uh, this is what I've come up with, that um, in health authorities, and it's not just in British Columbia, uh, it's common across the country, uh, it's, uh, the idea is that a case manager can just supply whatever information is needed. And I understand from case managers, their caseloads have gotten bigger. They also have no skills, no materials for doing this, and this is not the way to supply coherent psychoeducation. We need programs that people with illnesses take together in a group context in, for a sustained period of time. My daughter was very fortunate before the UBC Schizophrenia Day program closed after 25 years, because she and her friends received week after week for months in that day program solid psychoeducation about their illnesses. It helped them understand them, accept them, and learn to manage them. And there's been very few relapses among that population. We do not have this now. Um, we also need these programs to teach about anosognosia, this brain-based inability of 
uh, many, if not most people in deep psychosis to understand that they are ill. We need massive public education and also education for all service providers about this, but certainly for people struggling to understand their own illnesses and what they have been through as they're trying to, to grapple with them. I've also seen that it can help people in the early stages of relapse. Um, while we don't have good psychoeducation for clients, increasingly in the delivery of mental health services, we're supplying more and more opportunities for them to learn about the beliefs of the anti-psychiatry, anti-medication groups that are out there. Not just how common they are uh, in the wider culture, but from within the delivery of mental health services itself. So um, for instance, in Vancouver Coastal Health, if you subscribe to the uh, consumer newsletter, it's very common to have advertisement for the Hearing Voices Network. And there's some good things about the Hearing Voices Network because people do get support and they do get some strategies for coping with uh, ongoing auditory hallucinations, which people can have even when they are no longer psychotic. However, we have to acknowledge that this is a movement brought in from Western Europe and now spreading across North America that is based upon the belief of Dutch psychiatrist Dr. Marius Rahm and a whole network of people who share the belief that antipsychotic medication is a real problem because it interferes with processing the meaning of the voices so people can't heal. That's an interesting belief system. I don't see the evidence for it, but it's a really popular belief system. And uh, in the Hearing Voices Network in our midst, there's also study groups who especially focus on um, writers who then can become therapists for people and supposedly help them safely get off what are called these toxic medications. And I know cases where people are doing this and uh, getting really sick again, no matter how carefully they followed the instructions to taper uh, off their medications. Um, so as a taxpayer, that's not okay with me. Um, we need to improve um, education for all clinicians about uh, severe mental illnesses. We can't assume that they have all had really good quality education because in fact, many of them have had educations that have focused on psychodynamic theory or other theories that, are, that have very little to do with contemporary neuroscience. And really, contemporary neuroscience and contemporary psychiatry uh, talk about schizophrenia and bipolar disorder as brain disorders, as disorders of neural circuitry, as fundamentally medical disorders. Not that I know any uh, active psychiatrist who said, oh, all you need to do is give people pills, which is what the anti-psychiatry movement always accuses psychiatry of. I've never heard a psychiatrist say that. They all understand that people need comprehensive treatment, but for most people with these illnesses, medications are the foundation. Um, I'm gonna just hurry on. Um, we need to, people have already talked about, educate uh, people and families about FIPA. And um, uh, it, doesn't, it's not part of FIPA, but one thing that we can advocate for in relationship to it is that there really should be a policy that when families offer information, often called collateral information, to a service provider, and that information is essential for that service provider to make the best medical or psychosocial rehab uh, decisions and pieces of advice, if it's, it, if it's information that will further disrupt the relationship the person has with their family in this crucial time, the service provider shouldn't say, as too often they do, your parents told me such and such, because that really does uh, hurt the relationship. 
We need to improve the ability of all clinicians to cooperate with families. And we know that family involvement is the biggest predictor of how well people would do with these illnesses. But unfortunately, the mental health system too often develops an adversarial relationship with families. We need to survey families about their experiences of care. I'm waiting for somebody after 19 years to ask me about my experiences, um, although I just sort of keep saying it. Um, we need to um, <clears throat> improve psychosocial rehabilitation programs. Uh, one aspect of the recovery model is it's nice that it inspires hope, but it also really does not accept the existence of people who have really severe mental illnesses and who are not appropriate candidates for entering the world of competitive work. Meanwhile, the opportunities for supported volunteer work as the recovery model becomes more implemented are disappearing. It's the idea, oh, you know, that's so patronizing to these people. No, it can be really helpful for our family members. We need to educate everyone about the cognitive losses that are well researched that are part of these illnesses. People aren't hearing about these characteristics of their own illnesses. Staff haven't been trained about them and families haven't been trained about them, although now in our education courses we are. Because we also need everybody to understand that there is help available through evidence-based cognitive remediation programs. And I do need to take a minute to certainly thank the BC Psychosis Program who partnered with John Gray and me so that two years ago we were able to have Canada's first conference um, on cognitive remediation. And uh, early on we're given crucial support from the BC Psychosis Program and Dr. White, and we got crucial support from the BC Early Psychosis Intervention Program and BC Psychosocial Rehab. So we have a co coherent proposals for implementing across the province cognitive remediation programs, training staff who want this kind of training, and we have yet to receive funding from the provincial government. So we need to address the shortage of um, acute psychiatric beds. Well, I don't know what happened. There it is. And uh, we do have research now that uh, people who are discharged too early relapse. We need to develop more and better uh, supportive housing. How do we get to these improvements? Us. We families need to develop more and more skills to advocate for the kinds of services that our family members and other people with these illnesses so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next, we have Dr. White. Um, let me go back to the right place on that one. Um, okay, I'll find a page for you. Excuse me for a second. Got to wipe the fire. First, that's important. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, the doesn't matter really again there. I don't have a question on some of the items in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I really messed up on this page on this one. Hang on. Well, you can just read from the slide. There. <laughs> oh, you have them right up there. <laughs> okay, I guess you can all can read it correctly on that one. And uh, I think. Uh, Many of you already know uh, Dr. White, and he has been uh, serving this community for a long time and has still actively. Sorry. I said, uh, many of you have already known Dr. White, and uh, he has been actively serving the community for many, many years. And I'm going to let him speak to the uh, topic. Thanks. <clears throat> so um, it's great to be here. I'm here because Susan asked me to, to talk, and 
the topic was a little bit vague at first, but um, we came up with this, or I suggested this, I guess. Susan liked the idea because she thought many of you hear this term, tertiary mental health, but you know, don't really have a good grasp on what that means or what, it, what it's all about. So this is lifted from the website of Vancouver Coastal Health. If you search on the website, the term tertiary mental health, this is what you come up with. But let me back up for just a second, because if there is tertiary mental health or health care, then there has to be primary and secondary. So I'll ask you, what, what do you know what that is? What's primary care? Emergency. Sorry, emergency? Mm, not quite. No, primary care. Does somebody have something else to add? Yeah, your GP, right? So that's primary care. Your family doctor, you go there. For most you know, medical care, initially, if your family doctor decides that your needs aren't able to be met in his or her office, then you might be referred to a next level, the secondary level, which could be the hospital, uh, or it could be a specialist uh, affiliated with the hospital, a psychiatrist, for instance, or any other specialist. So tertiary care is the next level up. So it says here, our tertiary mental health services provide specialized care to meet the needs of individuals with serious and persistent mental illness who have not been successfully treated by other programs. So after someone has been in hospital, let's say at VGH or St. Paul's for a while, they're not getting better, then the staff, the doctor and the nurses might decide to refer the person for the tertiary level of care. Now, I want to give you a little bit of historical perspective here. So in the past, this level of care was provided at Riverview Hospital in Coquitlam, you know, which uh, was there for, for decades. At its peak, uh, I understand there were you know, more than 3,000 people there. And many of them stayed there for a long, long time. And of course, when uh, antipsychotic medications and other medications became available, the population started to go down. And then uh, in, throughout North America, deinstitutionalization uh, ensued. Riverview uh, actually only closed um, a short time ago in uh, about 2012. So the plan was for those facilities, I mean, that's from 1913, uh, but those facilities to be transferred to the health authorities uh, who were, were building these new uh, structures and programs. And that process started you know, in the early 2000s. The idea was, as I understand it, I wasn't actually here in BC at the time, Dr. Honer uh, can probably uh, say a little bit more about it, uh, perhaps, but the idea was that, you know, why send everybody to this big institution in Coquitlam? Uh, we should have these services available closer to where people live in their own communities. So, I mean, it sounds like a, a good idea. So, uh, by about 2012, there were 916 tertiary level beds in all the different health authorities. And Riverview Hospital closed. There were patients still in Riverview up to that point. And the program that I work in, BC Psychosis Program at UBC Hospital, accepted patients directly from Riverview in early 2012, as that, the program that was housing them then closed. So I, when I was uh, preparing for this, I 
went to the Ministry of Health and asked them, you know, can you give me a report or a sort of inventory of the tertiary mental health beds in the province? And so uh, I think a number of you know Garrett Vanderleer. He's, he was at the meeting last year, um, the, your meeting here. Anyway, so he was able to supply this. They had done a, uh, an inventory in the spring of 2019, as it turns out. So, um, so these are the numbers that they provided. Um, I'll talk about PHSA a little bit in detail because it, those are the, so that stands for Provincial Health Services Authority. And there's a, a, a portion of that um, called the uh, BC Mental Health and Substance Use Services. And they administer certain programs that are considered provincial. Uh, for instance, they fund the BC Psychosis Program. So this is the, the map that I came up with based upon that inventory. Um, the places where there are tertiary mental health services. And <clears throat> you can see the cluster in the lower mainland. I ran out of space to put the stars in. Um, there are quite a few uh, in Vancouver, in the Fraser Valley, um, and then uh, in a lot of other communities and the other health authorities. Um, some are larger than others, and I don't have time to talk about all of them in detail. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of services that are offered in a moment. Um, but uh, I guess you can see from the map that, you know, they, they're obviously mostly in places with um, a larger population. Um, but it, some of them, you know, it's a little hard to explain why they are where they are, but. So uh, back to the PHSA programs. Um, this is how they account for the beds. And you can see that the, the majority of them are at the Forensic Psychiatric Hospital, at Colony Farms in, in Coquitlam, 190. Those aren't really accessible to most of, uh, you know, of the people that we're concerned with, most of my patients, of your family members. Uh, you have to be sent there by the court, essentially. So um, the others, though, <clears throat> our general beds. Um, the Burnaby Center for Mental Health and Addictions, you may have heard of. It's actually gonna move soon to a new building on the Riverview grounds, but it is for people with concurrent mental illness and addictions. And this is an example of the programs in, uh, in a specific health authority, so interior health. Um, so, you know, and not every health authority has all these kinds of programs, but many of them have similar ones. So there are tertiary level um, programs for geriatric patients, older adults, uh, often with dementia or with chronic mental illness that may be um, complicated by dementia. Um, there are the so-called acute tertiary beds. So those are for patients who have been in a secondary hospital uh, haven't gotten better, need a longer duration of uh, treatment in an inpatient setting. <clears throat> and then um, residential care, rehabilitative beds, those are for patients uh, or for people whose illness has entered a more of a, um, uh, a stage of um, perhaps chronicity, but with some level of functional impairment, and so who requires support to try to reintegrate into the community. Now, I want to call finally your attention to this. Um, this is a publication by the Auditor General of BC, which was uh, published in 2016. The Auditor General undertook a review of the tertiary services in BC and uh, it's a, you know, a readable, I haven't read the whole thing, but I mean, I've looked it over and read parts of it. 
it's fairly readable. It's not too long, and, and there is a summary. There are 10 main recommendations. Um, and let me see if I can get my notes here. Yeah, so 10 recommendations. Uh, I think the, the most important ones were uh, they wanted province-wide standards and performance measures for tertiary mental health, which didn't really exist or don't exist. They're under development. And also planning for gaps that were identified in the tertiary system, uh, in particular for people with mental illness uh, and brain injuries, um, developmental disabilities, and also people with severe or uh, recurrent aggression. And we, I can say that we do struggle uh, with finding appropriate treatment settings for people with those problems. I, and I, I think Dr. Bates even mentioned it in his talk. So um, I think uh, I can stop there and we can uh, talk about it further in the question period. Okay, so now we have come to the question and Q&A section. And uh, we can get the discussion started. Uh, we are thankful that we have, again, Danita and Hardeep are going to be coming around. And if you have questions ready, please raise your hands. <coughs> and the people online can also submit their question as uh, on the right side of their screen as well. OK. All right, so, okay, we have, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, do we have a second mic? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I am hoping to become a member of the BC Patient Voices Network. I'm a person of lived experience of, of schizophrenia, and I was wondering what is the BC Schizophrenia Society and the BC government doing to improve system-wide mental health care and schizophrenia care in British Columbia to help people recovering from schizophrenia? Okay, uh, I think the question you're asking is that you asking how BCSS is helping people who's recovering? No, I'll repeat the question. What is the BC Schizophrenia Society and the BC government doing to improve system-wide mental health and schizophrenia care in British Columbia to help people recovering from schizophrenia? Okay. Um, I 
I could answer it yes, if you just want people you. to answer it. Certainly, I, we're not in a position as an organization to talk about what the BC government is doing. You'll have to get representatives of that government to talk to it. But in terms of the BC Schizophrenia Society, there are some basic things that we do, which is we offer psychoeducation to families. And this family education program is, is actually based on a program from the US that has demonstrated through a multi-year study at the University of Maryland that when families receive appropriate education, they are in a better position to support a person living with schizophrenia and that that reduces their relapses. So that's one thing that this organization does that's really crucial. Other things that we do are to sponsor various kinds of educational events like this one. But we should probably move on to the next questioners. Okay, I just had one other question. Is cognitive remediation starting to be used now to help relieve or eliminate cognitive issues faced by people with schizophrenia? Um, people are doing individual attempts in different settings, but what the goal of this big project was, was to bring in the heavy duty training for staff and uh, implementing um, training programs that are now evidence-based to get the best results. And those proposals from these four key organizations that have been uh, presented to the government have not yet received funding, but I think we are probably in total agreement that they should because that's really helpful for people to be able to develop better concentration, better problem solving skills, improve judgment, improve short term and working memory, and for some of our families, social skills they might have had earlier. There's great programs out there. We just need to get them funded. And does that also include cognitive remediation? That those are forms no, of cognitive no. I was going to ask: Does that also include cognitive remediation training for peer support workers to use with their clients? The program that we've connected to the most through um, Alice Medelia at Columbia absolutely incorporates the presence of peer support workers who have been through that training, so that they can be a help to other people. But the programs are not run by peer support workers. They're run by people who have advanced training in neurocognition and in these really um, complicated areas with these complicated skills. Yeah, because there is a role for peer workers. Because I didn't think cognitive remediation was that complicated. I thought that was something you don't need complicated training to do cognitive remediation therapy. Well, actually, I think that you do because the way it's uh, presented in the best programs, it's not just a computer activity. It's really getting in to how um, people have certain kinds of particular obstacles and how to address those obstacles and then how to go out in their daily life or school life or work life and try to um, Im improve on obstacles that they're experiencing because of these cognitive losses. So it's actually is fairly complicated, and I think that people with these illnesses deserve people with the greatest levels of expertise to be guiding these programs. All right. But of course we can help our, our friends, for sure, okay. with these issues. Thank you for the question, and thank you, Susan. Uh, we, ha we do have a limited time. Okay, so there is um, a section afterward that we can speak with the panelists to ask additional. So we're going to try to get to as many uh, questions from different people as possible. So. All right, I um, guess it's, are we done? Yeah, okay, uh, it's April here, my turn. I just, I wanted to follow up on that question from the individual. Um, um, as you know, Susan's with Pathways, um, but the, um, the Schizophrenia Society and the branches are offering, or at least the Kelowna branch is offering, the Strengthening Families Together uh, course. We used to offer the Families to Families course, which um, Susan and Pathways is doing, but uh, the Schizophrenia Society has the Strengthening Families course, 
which um, is extremely uh, successful, as was the Family to Family and Helping Families. But we are also, the Schizophrenia Society has the Your Recovery Journey program, and the Kelowna branch is still the only branch offering the Bridges program, and those two programs are for um, our loved ones living with mental illness and very successful in helping these individuals um, gain education and support and understanding of their mental health and recovery plan. As well, we're very successful in partnering with um, other organizations such as CMHA and their RAP program, Wellness Recovery Action Plan. And when we can get our loved ones engaged in all of these education courses, which is happening in Kelowna, we're seeing a really high rate of success of those living with mental illness. Um, um, Dealing, uh, dealing with their mental illness and not going into relapses as often, et cetera. So I just wanted to elaborate on some of the courses that the Schizophrenia Society has that is really working well. Um, and in Kelowna, um, we're educating, uh, we run the course back to back. It's amazing how once you um, work with other organizations like you're gonna get those programs filled. I uh, just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, the panel members. I wonder if I could get Dr. Bates or, 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 and or Dr. White just to comment briefly on the role of substance uh, use in um, our workload for clinicians and in access to treatment programs for those of our loved ones who in fact do not have substance use, but you did speak about the increase in, in admissions and the 43% uh, in readmission rate. Um, what is the role of substance use in our mental health system at the moment? Um, so so I'll, let, uh, I'll let Dr. White uh, talk too, but... Um, uh, just, just from my experience um, in, in training at where I was mostly at St. Paul's Hospital, I, I, I can confidently say that there's a huge uh, effect in terms of um, uh, what resources are being triaged to or, or, or used for. Um, so with, um, you know, with substances like, like crystal meth, uh, people who are using those substances are often coming in extremely uh, agitated, brought in by the police, requiring seclusion and, and medications pretty much immediately. Um, and uh, when, when there's sort of triage between someone like that and somebody maybe who has schizophrenia who is maybe not doing as well as usual but is kind of closer to their baseline and the story that the clinicians hear as well, you know, this person's kind of been like this for the past 20 years, uh, the, you know, the, the person who is acutely agitated and, and very different from how they are when they're not acutely intoxicated is often going to... Um, to get a certain priority, and um, uh, you know, I think that's um, well. I, not not that I think those people shouldn't be served as well, but um, there are just this limited number of, of beds, both in the emergency departments and also in psychiatric units. And and there's there's no doubt in my mind that people with chronic mental illness are um, are sometimes not getting the resources they need because of uh, the the epidemic of, of substance use difficulties. Yeah, th thanks, Alan. It's nice to be here with you, by the way. Alan was my resident at St. Paul's quite a while ago. Um, anyway, I, I want to just mention that, um, of course, everyone knows we're in the midst of an overdose death crisis. And we did a, an analysis of overdose deaths in Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, the, the public health unit did an analysis of of uh, the people who died in 2017. And then I worked with them to uh, look at that data and to see how many of those people had actually accessed mental health services. Because I was quite curious, you know, were, uh, were we seeing these people in our clinics? They, they had the data on the, um, the health encounters of all those people who died in 2017. Um, and it turns out that um, 61 out of um, how many, it was like 200 some odd, more than almost 300 people who died in the city of Vancouver, uh, 61 had been treated in a hospital. And uh, another 
90, well, actually, there could be overlap there, but anyway, 90 had been seen in mental health uh, clinics in the city of Vancouver. So that's another aspect of this. Um, that we know that people with you know, schizophrenia and other serious mental illnesses are dying of overdoses. Um, and when we looked at the, the discharge diagnoses, by the way, on the 60 people who were in hospital, about, um, I think it was 40 some odd had a, a schizophrenia diagnosis. Great. Did it address your question, Holly? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, is somebody? There's a question Great. Here. Oh, Hi, there. thank you. Okay. Hi, I'd also like to thank the panel members for your interesting presentations. And I'd actually like to ask uh, several, of you, several of you questions about the intersection of serious mental illness and our criminal justice system. Uh, for uh, me personally, I'm a parent, having gone through an experience in the last year, and I think that dealing with the criminal justice system has been the most difficult part of this and has actually exacerbated my son's illness. So what I'm curious to know is generally what's being done and what can be done. And for Dr. Bates and Dr. White, um, has there been research that actually looks at the impact of our criminal justice system on mental health? Um, and also for our advocates, and especially our parent advocates, what's being done and what can be done? How can, we, uh, how can I help? How can people with experiences like mine get involved? Thanks. Does, does any of you have experience you want well, to talk I, about? I will, sure. Sure, I'll go. Um, my son was arrested, uh, charged with assault with a deadly weapon um, in July. I didn't know anything about it. He was supposed to appear in court. He didn't appear. Uh, I was cleaning his room in September, the long weekend, and found the summons. Uh, freaked out. Um, found out what had happened, um, and um, I the, on on the Tuesday morning on my way into work, I um, I pulled over to the side of the road when I thought the offices were open and called, and um, the Vancouver courthouse told me to if I could get Daniel in. Um, into the court uh, system, which we did. I got him and we arrived downtown. I was met with a lawyer who um, interviewed us, uh, determined that Daniel was in treatment, that he was on medication, and that he was being looked after by his family member. Um, I looked around the courtroom and I looked at the, um, the people who were um, there for um, uh, who had committed an act, and, and I would say half of them were not too dissimilar from Daniel. Um, anyway, we got, our docket got moved right to the front. Um, the um, lawyer went and talked to the judge, and we were then moved into what's called a diversion program. And from diversion, Daniel had to meet with his um, probation officer every week. And even then, I explained that we lived on the North Shore, that um, the probation officer was downtown, which was a place that Daniel shouldn't be, given the circumstances of the east side. And um, they agreed to do a probation by phone. So I was very impressed, very impressed. Now, on the North Shore, it hasn't been the same. Families have come with similar situations. And they're, they're not too bad. The police and, and and the courts seem relatively responsive to this, understanding the nature, but it was much more challenging on the North Shore, so I guess it's jurisdictional. I think the jurisdiction is a huge issue. Yeah. The jurisdiction that I'm dealing with is Victoria. Yeah. It's a significant issue. We can't get CBWP diverted. Yes. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult. Yes. I'd like to add one comment. Because we do hear from human rights activists that it's terrible to have a system where people are not always allowed to choose whether they want treatment and that that must be a fundamental right. We have to understand when we look through the uh, ideas, the key documents informing this sense of 
everyone is always responsible, that they are perfectly fine with everyone who commits a crime being treated just the same. You commit a crime, then you have these consequences. So they would like to get rid of the not criminally responsible defense. They would like to get rid of any mandated treatment that does happen and often helps people get better in a forensic hospital, and in fact, get rid of forensic hospitals. And uh, for those of us who think someone who is psychotic should not be treated like a criminal when they don't understand what they've done, this is really an unacceptable interpretation of human rights. Uh, I guess I'll just add that um, you know, there are too many people in jails and prisons uh, with mental illness. I, you know, I don't have any numbers to draw upon, but my impression is, I'm from the U.S. originally, that it's uh, much worse there. Um, but with um, the data that Dr. Bates showed regarding the, um, the lack of acute psychiatric beds, you can only imagine that uh, it may get worse, or at least it could be better if we had more appropriate settings to treat people, um, as opposed to, you know, they're ending up on the streets committing, you know, whatever um, crimes and then going to into the criminal justice system. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that whatever trauma people may have being in, in a seclusion room in a hospital, which uh, I don't deny, uh, is traumatic. Um, you can imagine that it would only be worse if they're incarcerated instead of going to a hospital. I'd like to add one more note to that. Um, what, what I learned from my time as executive director at Pathways was how important our relationship with the local police authority were. And so we were very intentional about training our families to go into the West Vancouver Police Department and, and educating them on who we are and what we're about and what our sons and daughters, our relatives are about. Uh, North Vancouver RCMP, and in fact, we advocated for the North Vancouver RCMP to have um, not a car, um, was it 87, but very similar, so that they would could be responding. And that really was driven by the families at the society. And we were in contact. We had a call, for example, from a, a mother whose son was very ill. She was very concerned about him. We phoned Vancouver Police Department. We asked them to open a file. The mother then phoned gave her, them some detail. They went, couldn't find him at the house. They left. Later that night, there was someone found lurking in someone's yard, and they responded, assuming that it could be this young man, and their response was completely different than had it been, you know, a burglar or a bad, bad person. And so those are the kinds of things that, that families can do with the organizations like BCSS, like Pathways, like the chapters throughout the province critical um, way to, to address this. Um, you also asked, what, what can you do? Um, both these organizations, Pathways, and actually I'm not uh, officially connected to Pathways, although I really support their terrific mission, and, and I am to the BCSS, but both of these organizations have really important public education programs, um, partnership presentations, where they want a family member and usually um, a, a paid coordinator who talks about um, uh, serious mental illness to uh, different education groups, to the police, to the RCMP, the Justice Institute, nursing training programs, giving uh, people information they don't have. So a coordinator supplying basic information, um, a person who has an illness talking about their experiences with their illness, and also a family member. These are so important, and we really need more uh, consumers who un share our beliefs about these really are illnesses, talking about, about these illnesses, and we need more family members who are in a position to donate time, which really matters. So really good question for people wanting to know what you can do. And you'll be very pleased to know that on our board we have an ex-superintendent 
of uh, North Shore Police of Vancouver, of Victoria most recently. Why don't you stand up, Jamie, just so people can see you. <laughs> Okay, I think we have time Sorry, for Sorry, Joanne, she had a question first, and then Rachel. Rachel, you're in queue. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll make mine fast. Um, addressed to um, Dr. Bates and Dr. Gray, essentially. Um, the charter to the rights, I think, is a good thing that's happening. Um, everything you said, I agree with. But I think we also have to realize there's another side to the story. There are mistakes being made and some of them through police admittance to, um, to the health system when it's not needed. Um, I know of two examples of that. It happened a few years ago. And it can also do harm because they didn't understand what was happening because it was connected to the internet. The person went to the police to describe what happened, which was very serious. And Somehow it got handed from one branch to another, and then they didn't know what to believe and put the person into commitment against their wishes. And this was a very um, professional person to top it all. And um, it, once you are in there, from what I understand, it is exactly what is, is in the document called operating in darkness. If you say, I don't need this medicine, there is nothing wrong with me. I, I agree, most people would probably say that, but not everybody does. So we have to leave open the realization that mistakes are being made. Hence, how many people are now, is that happening to today? Because 70% spike in the commitments to mental health care or diagnosis, diagnosis I'm mostly talking about and then the care that follows right after, and then the human rights issues, and then the incorrect documentation of what was happening. When the person says, I don't need the medicine, okay. I don't want the medicine, so, uh, I'm fine. Are you asking a question? Yes, what, what is your I'm question? saying, please, um, what has been done in that area? I'm, I'm not disagreeing with what's being said. I respect all the people in the field, but it seems to me that the, ch the Charter Rights doc um, challenge is kind of one-sided and I can see why and I do agree more beds are needed and there are serious cases but it has to be looked so, at at all so sides. So I, I could just comment on one aspect of what you said perhaps. I, I did see the report in the media about the increasing uh, proportion of patients who are in hospital involuntarily as opposed to voluntarily and I think it may actually have something to do with the fact, as um, Alan uh, presented to us, that there are fewer overall beds than there need to be, most likely, and therefore only the patients who are the sickest and who absolutely have to be there are being admitted to hospitals. The patients who could be treated voluntarily are being you know, handled in the community settings. I agree with that, so, and that would work I, I fine. I don't know if that explains it all, but I think that may have something to do with it. <laughs> okay, just but it doesn't case, always work that way. See if this makes it any clearer with, I think, the point that's being made, which is when you don't have enough acute psychiatric beds for people who want to enter voluntarily, they end up getting more and more ill, and then they enter the system involuntarily. And that is one possible explanation for that rise. Could, could I just address some of the important issues that you raised about mistakes? So yes, it's, it's possible that somebody might get admitted uh, and shouldn't have got admitted, right? But in order to, to be admitted, you have to have two physicians both saying that you have a uh, definition, that you meet the definition of mental disorder, that you need psychiatric treatment, that you're likely to harm other people, et cetera, et cetera. It's possible they, those two could, could get fooled. So what we have, and, and uh, this is in all mental health acts, is something called a review panel, which you probably know about. And the review panel is set up so that if you think there's a mistake, even though everybody else doesn't think that it doesn't matter, you have your, as it were, day in court. You, would, you uh, have a lawyer that uh, is, is on your side, 
in most cases, some cases you, you, you don't have to have a lawyer, but many of you do. The hospital doesn't have a lawyer, but you do. On the, on the issue of uh, treatment, that, that look, I don't think I should be on the, these medications. The Mental Health Act allows for a second medical opinion. It's not as to whether you should be in hospital or not. It's w whether this is the right medication and the right treatment plan for you. So those things are there. Um, and they're basically similar in all, in all um, acts across the, the country. The concern we have about the treatment is that if you are an involuntary patient, right, in other words, the, the, the um, review panel said, yes, you're an involuntary patient, and then you say, I don't want this antipsychotic medication, right, and, you say, and they uh, must follow what you say if you're capable, uh, or if you have an advanced directive that says, I don't want to be treated if I get this uh, into this circumstance. So in, in that case, you can't be treated. Um, I mentioned Mr. Sevils, and this is what happened here. Mr. Sevils was in seclusion for 404 days because he couldn't be treated and he became very difficult to manage. It's the only way they could manage him. He then comes out and assaults, seriously assaults a nurse. Professor Starson went to the Supreme Court. He was in, in, had been there for three years, untreated. Supreme Court, this is Ontario legislation, but basically they still found him to be capable. He still refused until he, his delusions got to the point. He believed that his son, that he didn't have a son, uh, would, would uh, starve to death if he ate. He stopped eating to the point the internist said, if you don't get some hello parallel into this man, he's going to die. So now they're extreme examples. I've got a, I've got a good um, paper, if you'd, if you'd like to get it afterwards, of about half a dozen cases in Ontario, including one guy who has been in a hospital for 15 years. So that's why we're concerned. Thanks for the, uh, the question. Just a few, a few points to add or, or emphasize. Um, so with regards to some of the, uh, the deficiencies in paperwork that were outlined in the Ombudsperson's report, I think you know, BC psychiatrists absolutely agree that that has to be done properly as laid out in the Mental Health Act. And um, so, I mean, we, we couldn't agree more with, with health authorities having procedures in place to make sure that the paperwork is done as it's supposed to be done. Um, so I think sometimes um, there's sort of this this view that um, you know that psychiatry is sort of an industry or psychiatrists are part of an industry that need to you know make money through numbers of patients. Um, at least in BC, I mean that's just 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 not uh, at all where our our, our mind is. Uh, one of the nice things about being a psychiatrist is I know I'm never going to be unemployed. I'm never going to be bored or not have work. Uh, we are not looking for patients to bring into hospital. There's more than enough people. We're overwhelmed. Um, so there, there's no motivation harm. We have to, you know, bring people in for some kind of financial gain or something like that. That's just not a thing. Um, and um, yeah, the, the final point I wanted to make is around uh, mistakes. So, so, so we, we, we do make mistakes, uh, just like all other kinds of doctors. And you know, often the decision about whether to admit somebody to hospital or not is made at three in the morning and. Uh, the, the patient is saying one thing, you're right, the police are saying another thing, a family member is saying another thing, and um, you know, we, we, make, we make very difficult decisions sometimes, and, and sometimes we, we get it wrong, essentially, but I think, uh, I think it's fair to say that often we're erring on the side of, of what we think is safest. Okay. Involuntary ones where they ever asked their details, and how many deaths could be freed up? That's my main concern. If they were there and you need to be, because once you're in there, you're stuck in there for a long time. Oh, no, 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 you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> no, no, in BC, it's often a few days. It's on average, according to the 1927 area, what, 14 days. But that includes all the long stay people. Um, I do just want to say a little bit about, I understand why you were very influenced by this document written by the Community Legal Assistance Society operating in darkness. You have to remember that that is the society fighting 
the BC Mental Health, Health Act, saying there should be no involuntary treatment, inpatient or outpatient. And if, if you read it, you would assume that the people have consulted wi widely with all the impacted people. That's not true. Um, people like my daughter and her friends who know their lives depended on getting involuntary treatment when they were really sick, nobody consulted people like them or their families. Okay. All right. We're, we're actually over time, but we have somebody waiting online. So we're going to have one last question um, online. Okay. Yes. Uh, we have a few questions here. Let me pick one. Um, so someone is wondering whether there are programs and services focusing on the mental health issues of newcomers in BC specifically. Sorry. Did you hear that or no? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll give it a, a shot, I suppose. Um, I, I mean, I don't know that the, the health authorities have anything specific along those lines that they offer. Um, other than at v Vancouver General Hospital, there is a cross-cultural psychiatry clinic, um, which uh, is helpful for immigrants. And then I think some of the voluntary or NGO organizations, um, you know, offer assistance. They can't offer mental health services per se, but they can help people find um, treatment if they need it. Now, uh, refugees have a special status in Canada, and they do have access to um, health care um, through the federal program. Um, but they would be accessing the services that are available to anyone, pretty much. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming, and we thank our panelists for their very educational, informative uh, presentation this afternoon. And uh, let's. Is it beer? <laughs> I think we have a little <laughs> gift for our panelists. You want to go ahead and just yeah, pass them? Absolutely. Thank you. Susan, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, that was a bad hand check. There we go. <laughs> thank you. John, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Alan Bates, thank you very much. And Nancy, last but not least. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. All right. So thank you, Dave. Okay, so we're gonna have Dave wrap it up here. So I'd just like to thank everybody that came and participated, and I hope that we were able to uh, not only bore you with an annual general meeting, but we're able to en encourage you uh, with, with the wonderful discussion that we've been able to have. Thank you, panelists. I'm so happy and proud that you uh, agreed to join us and do what you did. And audience, you're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>